So everyone, it is 4.02 p.m. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Ted Clement, and I'm the Executive Director of Save Mount Diablo. Welcome. Uh, welcome to our Honoring the Past, Inspiring the Future Zoom Lecture Series. For those who might be new to Save Mount Diablo, we are a nationally accredited nonprofit land trust formed on December 7, 1971 in the East Bay section of the San Francisco Bay Area. We have a mission to protect the important open space lands associated with Mount Diablo and the mountain's connection to its sustaining Diablo range. To create lasting public benefits for our communities and local flora and fauna, we use various tools like land acquisition, advocacy, education, and land stewardship. In the theme of honoring the past, inspiring the future, I now wanna to read to you a land acknowledgement statement that Save Mount Diablo's board of directors recently approved at their January board retreat. Save Mount Diablo recognizes that we are guests on the unceded ancestral lands of the Bay Miwok, Mwekma Ohlone, Northern Valley Yukut, and other tribes and tribelets, peoples who have loved and cared for Mount Diablo as a sacred mountain since time immemorial. Many of these people continue today as thriving members of the diverse communities of the greater San Francisco Bay Area and the larger Diablo Range region. We acknowledge and honor the Bay Miwok, Ohlone, and Northern Valley Yukut tribes as well as all of the indigenous people of the lands which Save Mount Diablo serves. So at Save Mount Diablo, we're in the midst of our 50th anniversary celebration, which will continue through December 7th, 2022. As part of the celebrations, we are doing various special events and activities. For this year long celebration of our 50th, we have rebranded our Nature Heals and Inspires Zoom lecture series into Honoring the Past, Inspiring the Future. We are also offering some 50th anniversary themed free public educational outings in our Discover Diablo program. We are doing an oral history with UC Berkeley's Oral History Center of the Bancroft Library. And we are doing other related events like a big and very special Moonlight on the Mountain party celebrating our 50th at China Wall in Mount Diablo State Park on Saturday, September 10th. So mark your calendars for what is going to be a great gala and check our website for more details. When Save Mount Diablo was formed in 1971, Mount Diablo was home to just one 6,788 acre park, Mount Diablo State Park. Today, there are more than 50 parks and preserves around the mountain north of Altamont Pass, totaling over 120,000 conserved acres. And Mount Diablo State Park itself has grown to about 20,000 acres. Thankfully, because of Save Mount Diablo and our generous supporters and good partners like East Bay Regional Park District, Mount Diablo and its foothills are one of the Bay Area's most significant assemblages of natural lands and wildlife habitats. Few realize when they look toward Mount Diablo, however, that the beautiful vistas they see are not fully preserved. Over 60,000 additional acres of natural lands on and surrounding the mountain north of Altamont Pass are in private ownership and are threatened by development or other land uses. Mount Diablo is the northern part of the Diablo Range, which extends for over 200 miles through 12 counties down to Kern County. The Diablo Range is a biodiversity hotspot and an important wildlife habitat corridor. So there is a reason why you see so many golden eagles in the Mount Diablo area. The Diablo Range has the highest concentration of golden eagles on the planet. In other words, Mount Diablo is sustained and supported by its Diablo Range. For this reason, Save Mount Diablo expanded its geographic scope further south into the Diablo Range to help ensure that Mount Diablo will not get cut off from its sustaining Diablo range due to things like overdevelopment and bad planning. This expansion is especially important in this time of the climate crisis and mass species extinction event. Thanks to our supporters and terrific Save Mount Diablo team, we have started this year, 2022, with incredible momentum. In January, we permanently conserved almost 154 acres 
on the slopes of Mount Diablo's North Peak with the Concord Mount Diablo Trail Ride Association. Then in February, we won an important lawsuit where we challenged the city of Pittsburgh's approval of the Sino owned Discovery Builders 1,650 unit Faria development project, a massive project proposed to be built on the hills between Concord and Pittsburgh above the site for the new Thurgood Marshall Regional Park that we advocated for over many years. In February, we also learned that our discussions with the Semex Corporation over the past six years were successful as the company just agreed and announced that they will protect an important 101 acre parcel contiguous with Mount Diablo State Park. And by the end of March coming up, we will open our free public Mangini Ranch Educational Preserve, the first of its kind in Contra Costa County. Our educational preserve will afford intimate and educational experiences in nature to one group at a time. It will be open free of charge to a variety of groups pursuing educational purposes, such as the following examples, a high school science class, an adult education nature photography course, a yoga class, a plein air artist gathering, a trail running club, an elementary school field trip, an addiction recovery group, et cetera. Our educational preserve at our Mangini Ranch will be run with an online application and reservation system. Thankfully, because of great supporters like all of you and others, we know we can continue our terrific conservation momentum and success. Thank you. Today, we have a gift of gratitude for you, a special presentation by a very special presenter, Robert Doyle's presentation, and let's call him Bob. Bob's presentation about our founders in history of advocacy as the first segment of our 50th anniversary honoring the past Inspiring the Future Zoom Lecture Series. We call Robert Bob because he's part of our team. He's been part of our Save Mount Diablo family for a long time, and it's, it's a real treat to have uh, him with us. Bob, as you may know, is a veteran of the parks and open space field with a career spanning 40 plus years. He previously served as general manager of the East Bay Regional Park District. In 1971, Bob was a founding board member of Save Mount Diablo. As board president, he greatly expanded the organization's membership and did many other wonderful things for Save Mount Diablo. Again, we still consider Bob part of the Save Mount Diablo team and family. Bob, I just personally wanna thank you for your incredible conservation work over so many years. My family and I directly benefit from a lot of your hard work at the incredible parks and open spaces that we're so lucky to have here in the area. And I uh, just wanna thank you for providing this gift of gratitude to our supporters. I know they're gonna love your presentation. And uh, everyone, there will be time for questions at the end of Bob's presentation. And Karen will help moderate uh, those questions uh, for Bob to answer. And you can input those questions into the chat box. So that's all I've got, Bob. Uh, again, thanks and take it away. Well, thank you, Ted. and. Um... Thank you for that wonderful land acknowledgement. Very important. Uh, also, I congratulate you on the success of um, particularly the recent successes by St. Mount Diablo, continuing that 50 year legacy of success. Today, I wanna take you through a, a winding path of how we got here. I think that uh, it's easy for us to take for granted uh, the effort, the challenges, the victories, and the losses over 50 years of the beautiful places that we now have uh, to recreate, to visualize, and to in, engage our own personal spirit in, in healthy uh, thoughts and happy thoughts. Uh, the early farmers that settled in this county uh, called the county, the garden of the gods, because we live in a very special place that I do think we take for granted. Um, even with climate change, we live in a, a, a mild climate with mild winters. Uh, we have sunny days. We have the breeze from the Delta and the Bay. We have miles and miles of shoreline. And we have these wonderful foothills of the Diablo Range, including our 
own special mountain. I think it's really uh, important to acknowledge the people uh, that were before us in a lineage of parks. And I, I will start, of course, with our own special John of the Mountains, John Muir. And I think it's just important that our own neighbor uh, who lived in Martinez um, had probably created the, the real advocacy in California, not just for parks and for Yosemite Valley that's so famous, but really believed that through writing, through seeing, uh, through access is believing why these places should be preserved. And that, that lineage has continued today. John Muir establishing the, the Sierra Club, doing the first outings uh, for the Sierra Club, encouraging writers himself and other writers, artists, painters, and photographers throughout the decades have really told the story of why we have these beautiful places, even if you can't go there or can't go there regularly. And I think that's, that's something that has continued today by Save Mount Davo and by conservationists throughout the country and locally. I also wanna mention another person and that person is, is, is one of my heroes as a park leader. And he, that person would be celebrating their 200th anniversary on April 26 of this year. And that is federal, uh, that is uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. You all probably know about Central Park and the East Coast parks, the 700 parks that uh, he worked on. And he, he really believed that every city should have a big park in its center that is the heartbeat of that healthy community. Uh, I think that most think of urban parks, not like uh, state parks or national parks, but Flo, as we call him, uh, spent a few years up in the Sierra Nevada. And while he was there, he worked on the very first plan for the then state park in Yosemite Valley. And he was so taken by its beauty and its dramatic landscape that it actually changed him in spirit and soul that as he looked at all the future parks that he and his firm, including his sons, would design and plan that really incorporate the concept of visual integrity, of scenic long vistas. And the, he and his family were huge players in establishing the National Park Service and in promoting more natural landscapes to be preserved, although known for the urban parks that he did. So his short time in, in the Sierra Nevada, again, was the first plan. And unfortunately, that plan was buried. It became a controversy, which will be a theme today. It became a con controversy because it was too preservationist oriented. And it wasn't until John Muir really advocated for the state, for the national park there and the expansion of Yosemite Valley that, that really things started to happen. But it was a failure and a big disappointment for Olmsted Sr. that it was not accepted because they wanted more development. They wanted more, uh, more hotels and, and all those things in, in that beautiful valley. So it's a theme that I, I really think about today that's just as appropriate of how you acquire and manage and, and build parks. Um, and that leads us to his son, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., the person who he, as one of the partners in the firm with his, his brother, John Charles, uh, did the very first state park survey of all of California. It was a incredible undertaking. And that project really came about because of advocacy from Save the Redwoods League, from a lot of conservation leader, leaders, both in California and, and across the nation. We thought California should have a, a really visionary uh, plan for the future of parks. And one of the things that 
in reading that plan that I, I really enjoy was his concept of, you know, this may be 1928 when he did it, but at some point in time, there's gonna be so many people in California. And we need to both serve that people and that growth by providing wonderful beaches and parks in Southern California and lakes, but also to preserve the magnificent redwood forest and, and Lake Tahoe and the Calaveras big trees. So he was from the very beginning balancing the preservation conservation of landscape and also the need to serve a diverse population. And I mean diversity from the standpoint of coming from all over the world and country and even more important today. And so we need to keep those things in mind. And that leads me to the East Bay, where we all live and enjoy one of the best places to live on earth. Even with our population, we live in an incredibly beautiful area. And as Ted said, with some of the most dramatic landscape, diverse landscape, and most preserved land in any urban area, it really is unique here in our East Bay. And it was Frederick, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr that was convinced to take on this little plan for the park district after he had done the Los Angeles County plan that again was buried by real estate interests, developers and powerful people as being too many parks, too much conservation. And so he was exhausted and he had completed the state park plan. So he wasn't very excited about this little plan in the East Bay, but a wonderful conservationist and real estate developer named Duncan McDuffie, a, a founder of uh, Mason McDuffie Real Estate, had been a Sierra Club leader, a Sierra Club president, a mountain climb, climber, a, a big part of the Save the Redwoods League. And he convinced uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. that it was worth it, even though it was the little plan. And he was able to get the National Park Service naturalist who was working at UC Berkeley, Ansel Hall, to, to go up and do a survey of the hills above UC Berkeley, where he was familiar with this area, and help to convince Olmsted that this is worthy of a plan and of preservation. The East Bay Municipal Utility District had built the new dams in the Sierra Nevada, and they didn't need uh, all the land they had acquired in the East Bay Hills. So they were going to sell 10,000 acres of hill land. And so it was really the, the Olmsted Hall report that created this unique new concept of not a national park or a state park, but of a regional agency to acquire and manage this new park system. And that was accomplished through efforts of, of the, the Contra Costa Hills of UC Berkeley professors, administrators of leaders throughout the, the 10 original cities along the East Bay shore. But none of that included Contra Costa County. Contra Costa County and the parks that we have today would have to wait many more decades to the 60s before that opportunity would exist to add those portions of Contra Costa County to the East Bay Regional Park District. Think of that. There were no regional parks until the 1960s in all of Contra Costa County, except for that 6,000 acre Mount Diablo State Park. And so that's kind of the, the, the advocacy that needed to happen. You know, John Muir also said that, you know, if you look at nature, everything is hitched to one another, everything is hitched. And I believe that that's also true with people that the, the lineage and the legacy of creating these wonderful parks and of preserving Mount Diablo is really linked to the early efforts of Muir and Olmsted in, in as a Muir living in Contra Costa County and of Olmsted doing work here, both father and son uh, in our area. So I, I think it's really important to, to reflect on why this little plan of the East Bay Regional Park District was so successful when the Yosemite plan was not allowed until the National Park Service took over and the LA plan 
was not allowed because of powerful interests. And that, that really comes down to this theme of, of advocacy. Uh, obviously, John Muir being probably the quintessential advocate for national parks and for preservation, but also at the local level. There is no question that the creation of taking the Olmsted Hall report and creating a unique new regional agency for parks would not have happened without the local advocacy of some of the very same people that you will hear more about. And that leads me to probably something most of you have never heard about. And that was the Contra Costa Park Council, a citizens voluntary group who were advocating for more parks in Contra Costa County. Uh, people who you hear in the Save Mount Diablo lineage, like Dr. Mary Bowerman and Art Bonwell and um, Jane Helrick, who I will talk a little bit about because she's very important to my, my lineage in parks. They're all many of the same people who advocated for the regional park system were members of the Contra Costa Park Council. A former president of Save Mount Diablo, Sue Watson, was an early leader in the Contra Costa Park Council. Board members and founding members, Genevieve and Bill Sattler, were part of the Contra Costa Park Council. Manny Linder, Al Burton, many other people that are long-term uh, advocates for parks were all in this little group got paid nothing, were just people of generous spirit who loved parks and were advocating for Mount Diablo, were advocating for Las Trampas to be preserved, were advocating for a coal mine park in Eastern Contra Costa County, were advocating for, for Briones Regional Park. And as a part of that, there was a sub little group called the, the Contra Costa Park Youth Council made up of high school students of which I was invited by Jane Helrick, who was a science teacher, to participate in. And we became a part of the Contra Costa Park Council too. So the very first effort to add Contra Costa County into the East Bay Regional Park District failed. It was in 1963. It was a county-led effort through the Contra Costa Park Council. And it did not, it did not pass the vote to create it. So enter William Penn Mott Jr., National Park Director, State Park Director, and East Bay Regional Park District Director in the, in the 60s. Bill Mott was pulled away from the parks in Oakland and, and hired by the East Bay Regional Park District Board of Directors to help expand the park system and particularly expand it with a bigger vision into Contra Costa County. He brought along a, a incredible public relations person named Richard C. Trudeau, who had connections with the business community and he ran the United Way efforts in the Bay Area to raise money for good causes. And they, they started to put together the effort through the park district and the park council to annex the majority, but not all of Contra Costa County, knowing that they had just lost an election, they were gonna reboot and try it again. And one of the people who were key in the formation and efforts in the Sierra Club and in the Contra Costa Park Council was Hewlett Hornbeck, an East Coast attorney who moved to Martinez and loved our hills and loved to hike and he led this campaign to add the East Bay Regional Park District to uh, Contra Costa County, that annexation. He also worked as did Mott and Trudeau with John Nedgedly, who was our assembly member and then our Senator for years, long time before term limits and was the chair of the Natural Resources Committee in the state of California legislature. John Nedgedly became one of the most significant conservation leaders in all the history of legislative action in this state. He sponsored many, many bills on conservation, park bonds, environmental impact reports, um, so many things. And John became a dear friend of mine and of the Save Mount Diablo effort. So 
what happened is it did pass. It passed closely. And it was through that leadership of Hornbeck and all of these volunteers and of Bill Mott and Richard Trudeau that a very large portion, particularly the areas around Mount Diablo, Central County, San Ramon Valley were added to the East Bay parks. In addition to that, they went to the legislature and to John Nedgedly to get additional funding to buy these new parks. It would be great to add to the park district, but you would need money to buy and preserve and create the park. So Senator John Nedgedly was able to get new funding for the park district. And that was really critical to start that. So William Penn Mott decided he would hire Hewlett Hornbeck to be the person to really start the ball rolling on buying new parks at, at Brownies Park, at, at Black Diamond Mines, at Las Trompas, Diablo Foothills, Morgan Territory. All this happened in the very beginning as the park district was now moving forward with new money and with also uh, the ability to have staff to negotiate with property owners and have planning and create a park system. So that is the creation of how the finally we had an East Bay Regional Park District and these new parks surrounding Mount Diablo, their beginnings, their infancy. And so that led really to a frustration that our only state park, uh, there's a small Frank's Track wetland preserve in the Delta, but the only state park in our Contra Costa County was Mount Diablo State Park. And it sat there at about 6,000 acres with very little happening. And that became a frustrating situation for two very important people. And if you can kind of see this a little bit, this is Art Bonwell, if it shows up at all, Art Bonwell and Mary Bowerman, the founders of Save Mount Diablo, decided that that's great that now we have the East Bay Regional Park District here, but Mount Diablo State Park needs its own advocates to expand and preserve it. Recognizing that that 6,000 acres was about the top one quarter of the mountain of North Peak. North Peak wasn't even in the park. So I think we always assume it was a state park. It must be most of, the, most of it, and it is not. So they helped and added people from the Sierra Club, added people from the Contra Costa Park Council, invited about 20 people for the founding meeting to create in its infancy this little engine that could called Save Mount Diablo. And eventually they incorporated as a nonprofit and it was really the effort of a very small core group that kept going there. Lots of people made great contributions to it, but then over the years have come and gone. But the core group for the first 25 years was really those early founders. And it was just my tremendous honor to meet these people of not only tremendous intellect and expertise, but also of a spirit and a generosity of spirit that were determined, even with kindness, to, to figure out a way to get the park expanded. So the very first thing they did was lucky for them, the same Bill Mott that annexed Contra Costa County and was the director of the East Bay Regional Park District was hired to be the state park director. And so we had a relationship with Bill Mott. And so the very first thing they started doing was meeting in Sacramento with state park officials and the new director. And also meeting with John Nedgedly to say, Senator Nedgedly, you really got to get money specifically to expand uh, Mount Diablo State Park. It has not been expanded. Other state parks had been expanded up and down California, but not our centerpiece of this county. So the very first act, one of the very first acquisitions that they did was that they were able to get a property owner on the corner of Marsh Creek and Morgan Territory Road near the old Cinnabar mine, the Mercury mine, and get a willing seller and raise some money to get that property. 
When that happened, the state agreed to double the size of that purchase by buying more property in that area. And the significance of that is most of the mountain had been acquired near the top and eventually Mitchell Canyon in the north side, but very little had come all the way down. So this brought the mountain all the way down to the, to the roads, to Marsh Creek and Morgan Territory. So, so it was strategic thinking going, we were a very tiny group, we didn't have very much money, but what would be significant strategically to help push the state park uh, lower down the mountain. And I think it was a, a brilliant move. So one of the other things that St. Mount Diablo did at the very beginning was they would, they would hold field trips and Mary, Dr. Mary Bowerman would uh, be able to contact the property owners, do the research and get permission to do a field trip. And, sh and we would invite uh, Hewlett Hornbeck to come on a field trip. And we'd, we'd have lunch and all of a sudden Mary Bowerman would roll out this big map of all the properties around and Hewlett looked, looked at her and said well what's your priority and Mary would go she'd wave her hand and say well this is all our priority but Hewlett would say no specifically of these four properties which is say my dad was priority and that's how they did the same thing with other people in state parks and so we had field trips to Morgan Territory. We had field trips to Black Diamond, to Las Trampas. Jane Herrick, the science teacher who brought me in originally, uh, loved Las Trampas and really worked with John Nedgley to find money to expand for the regional park, Las Trampas, and create a Las Trampas wilderness. And so those were some of the early, early uh, successes. But um, I also got to meet, for me personally, I got to meet another botanist and park manager named Walter Knight, uh, who had worked in the uh, Tilden Botanical Garden and became a manager of parks. And he hired me eventually to be, uh, to work in the parks. And that started my career at the park district. But I did that while I was working through college. But at the same time that we were getting action going through the state park system, tremendous development pressure started to happen more and more in these foothill areas and down the valleys in the county. And so it was a period of development and controversy. And uh, in 1965, the population of Contra Costa County was around 400,000 people. Think about today, it's a million people in Contra Costa County alone. So enter a person that has not been talked about very much. His name was James Cutler. He was the senior planner and then deputy director for a long-term planning at Contra Costa County. And another thing Save Mount Diablo do, did was to invite people to meetings and have them talk about what their role and what we should do. So they would regularly invite James Cutler. And, and, and Jim Cutler basically said, look, you're not gonna be able to buy everything you want on this big map. It's not gonna happen. There is too much money. Other people own it that don't want to sell. There's a lot of development pressure. So you need to learn to engage with the planning process, with developers, with advocacy. And I think the big first issue there, right about that time, a Florida uh, developer had bought the entire Blackhawk Ranch, about more than 3,000 acres. And they were proposing a huge new development out San Ramon Valley. You probably all know where that is now, out, out uh, Casa Heron and Blackhawk Roads. And they were gonna build over a thousand houses in the foothills. And they offered 300 acres to the state park. And they said, we'll even create an organization to advocate and support our development called Friends of Mount Diablo State Park. And Jim Cutler said, there are two ladies out there who are fighting this development and they are having a tough time and Save Mount Diablo should help. Mary Bowerman loved those foothills out towards the, the ridges of Oyster Point and, and Fossil Ridge. And so we got involved as well in that. And there was even lawsuits formed uh, by these two ladies because they were literally harassed by people who were turning over tables where they're collecting signatures. And so lawsuits 
were filed by the ladies. And the controversy was big enough that we were able to work with the county and Jim Cutler and the conservation community. And we ended up with over 2,000 acres. Yes, the development got approved, but over 2,000 acres were added to the state park and about another 1,000 acres uh, were preserved as private open space. So that was really the first time that Save Mount Diablo got directly involved in big development and in advocacy for some type of uh, compromise and some type of success to add land to the park. But the next site to talk about is really what I call the last big ridge top development in Contra Costa County. And if you can believe it, a Southern California oil company, Unical, had a real estate arm and they had bought the ridges above Round Hill Country Club, and which is currently what you see from uh, Moonlight on the Mountain, Save Mount Diablo's very successful fundraiser. And I was invited by Jim Cutler, I think I was snuck in to the county to look at this map. There was no EIR, there was no, uh, Save Mount Diablo could not even get a map of the proposal from the county. That's what it was like back in the 70s. And so I was able to Xerox in eight and a half by, you know, 11 Xerox sheets, this map, so Save Mount Diablo could look at it. But it was approved. It was approved on the ridge top, and it is very visible. It's even located in highly flammable chaparral and whip snake habitat. And I think myself and Save Mount Diablo were really determined not to let that ever happen again. And so that really was, uh, again, uh, it was a loss, but at the same time, it really was a, a maturing of commitment on advocacy to preserve those ridges. And think about it, it is the only large scale ridge top development surrounding Mount Diablo State Park and its foothills. So it, in, in the long run, it was a lesson learned and we, we learned a lot. So, you know, while, while park expansions were being funded with the help of Senator Nedgley and then later on, Senator Dan Boatwright, who took John's place when he retired, and it, we were doing pretty well in getting money out of the state of California, but this development pressure continued. And we kept pushing and kept pushing. And at one point, there was a Getty Oil Company and I guess people should realize that sometimes these big corporations own real estate just for real estate development. And the Getty Oil Company property uh, was up for sale and Save Mount Diablo wanted to buy it. And at that time, we were raising the money. We were talking to Senator Nedgley and it was going on and on. And the Albert D. Sino company optioned the property. And so we ran to John Nedgley and we said, you know, we, we really need the money right now. We need a million dollars from the state legislature right now to protect this property before and convince the property owner to sell it to us. And John got rather angry and he said, this is way too late. You should know I can't just do legislation this, this time of the year. It's the end of the legislative season. And Mary just looked at him and stared and said, well, you really need to try hard. And he wasn't very happy at Mary. Uh, and to, to, the, to the day he died, he said to me, he said, did Mary ever thank me for that? Within two days, we found out that he had put in a spot bill to appropriate a million, one million, one hundred thousand dollars at the end of the legislature, legislative season to buy this property. That's the type of advocacy and leadership and of a champion that John was. And so we were able, so what happened then is we kept negotiating, kept negotiating. We had other people help talking to Sino and the property owner about not developing it. And one weekend, a brand new house went up over the weekend. A new house went up over the, the weekend built by the Sino company on the property on the flatland. It's still there today. But we were able to push hard enough to buy all the upland, uh, about, about 200 acres, and add it to the park. But it was that difficult. One of the proposals, believe it or not, was to actually 
uh, Mr. Cena was going to donate it to a zoo. And there, there was a local zoo that um, was in kind of in the Concord area. And they needed a place and he was going to donate it to them. So it was yet another crazy thing that Save Mount Dabble had to deal with it. But we were able to buy the property. Another example was Senator Boatwright of advocacy for Save Mount Diablo and for Save Mount Diablo's relation, positive relationship with legislators is Dan Boatwright had worked in the legislature to appropriate $6 million for the southeastern expansion along Marsh Creek Road of the state park. This came out of a park bond and he specifically put that money to allocate it for Mount Diablo. And all of a sudden, the prop, one of the key properties was optioned for purchase to build, to reopen an old quarry called the, the, the Schwartz Quarry. And it was a big Oregon uh, quarry company. And Dan Boatwright just called them up and read them the right act and said, if you ever want to get another approval in California, period, uh, you better not mess this up. So they agreed to drop their option and the state park was able to acquire the property. So these things weren't easy. Um, and I think one final one would be uh, Save Mount Diablo really pushed the state to buy North Peak and to buy the Murchio property uh, in Mitchell Canyon. And they, this happened uh, about the same time period in the mid seventies and North Peak had some radio towers on it. And the state was able to buy the property. It was a very difficult negotiation, but they allowed the property owner to keep an easement for radio communi for communication sites. And all of a sudden that owner decided that they would use that easement to build a series of TV station towers like Mount Sutro in San Francisco. Hard to believe. And so say Mount Diablo, and I really want to acknowledge Sue Watson's uh, really strong help on this. We were pushing and pushing and pushing. We challenged it. We challenged it at the federal level. Save Mount Diablo did. We challenged it at the local level. It was a huge battle. The end result is a, a, a broadcast station got approved up there, but um, it was never going to be, it had to stay within a footprint and never be the size of something like uh, like that. So another challenge, even when something's acquired or supposedly acquired by the state park, they were these big challenges. On the Murchio property, which is the that beautiful grassland in the front of uh, the north side of, of Mount Diablo State Park, the state was buying Mitchell Canyon and they also were going to buy some of the quarry site, which is very appropriate for Ted's announcement earlier. And Jen and Bill Sattler and Mary and Art really felt that that grassland, which was going to be built with housing all the way up to the bottom of Twin Peaks in Donner and Mitchell Canyons, was so important that that is what needed to be acquired. And so we pushed the state. William Penn Mott was not happy. He wanted to just do the, the area more towards the, the west. And we convinced them uh, of, I think one of the greatest successes of Save Mount Diablo was that gorgeous flat area that would have been developed uh, in the front of Mitchell Canyon. And so I think that's really, really uh, an important acquisition. So I, I want to leave time for uh, questions, but I also want to talk about our first employee, Seth Adams, just for a second, who led the same charge with the Crystal Ranch at Lime Ridge. Uh, creating a, a big effort there to, to push back development, preserve most of those areas there and continuing that le legacy, uh, difficult advocacy um, and compromise as well for Save Mount Diablo. But during the 1970s and 80s, because in 1988, the East Bay Regional Park District passed its largest measure at that time, $250 million, it led to um, I was hired in 1985 to replace Hewlett, and in 1988, the majority of that money, 75%, was to go and expand the parks. And a succession of full square miles of properties in Riggs Canyon, at, at Black Diamond, in Irish Canyon, and Morgan Territory connected all these pieces 
including new parks at Vasco Caves Preserve and at Round Valley Regional Park. And that all happened after Measure AA, which was East Bay Regional Park District funding. And Save Mount Davo was a clear, critical advocate in getting the, this money passed and supporting that action by the voters. So I, I think it's just the really important to realize how much effort goes into these things. And the final really big uh, funding issue was the huge success of the Contra Costa Habitat Conservancy. They have now, uh, again, with leadership by the Park District and of course, critical leadership by Save Mount Diablo. And over $15 million have been uh, obtained through federal and state funding, $50 million through federal and state funding to acquire over 10,000 acres since that was, a, was approved. So today, Ted mentioned some recent victories. And I wanna mention something that is very dear to me. I grew up in Concord. Both of my, my brother and my father both worked for the Navy at the Concord Naval Weapons Station. I was very familiar uh, with the property, was able to go on the Navy property when I was a kid uh, to, to tour with my dad, hang out with my dad. And that I knew that when that uh, proposal to close that base, that there was some really special places there. All of the water from the top of Mount Diablo in the Mitchell Canyon, Donner Canyon, Back Canyon, and Diablo Creek come together in Clayton and go all the way through the Concord Naval Weapons Station and out to a 2,000 acre marsh that the Navy still owns. And I really thought this should be a new park. And I thought that would be pretty easy uh, at the time. And as soon as the park district, as soon as I proposed that to the park district and the park district moved forward on it with great support from Director Radke and particularly Director Lane at the park district, it became a controversy. There was no interest in Concord or others to have a very big portion of the park set aside as a regional park. They wanted to see golf courses and a Black Hawk for Concord. And um, it, it was so controversial, but even the National Park Service who would engage with us on the transfer of the federal property, which they can do under what's called a beneficial conveyance, they were even extremely nervous and held back their support until we were able to get more support to create a park over half of the property will be that is now owned by the park district and will be that new uh, Thoroughgood Marshall Regional Park. And uh, it's really a great thing, but it would not have happened without Save Mount Diablo's advocacy. They organized the neighborhood. They met and met and met with people. They, they worked with us pro park council members. They supported all the way through and I just think it took four Congress members before we were actually able to get an agreement on that. And so it was really George Miller who sat down on a table with a map and myself uh, confidentially and said, where should the line be? And I said, you've got to have, you got to have Mount Diablo Creek preserved and all the hills above, above that. So over half of that was done and it was George Miller who really said to Concord and others, this is going to be a park and here's where the line is. And uh, it's one of my uh, funnest uh, things and at this time, scariest things. There was a lot of frustration and opposition to it, but through advocacy, through having citizens and Save Mount Diablo support a big park there, uh, we have that today. And I think that's just a, a wonderful way to, to end the presentation. You know, there have been many examples of leadership and, and people of generous spirit um, over the last 50 years, from Muir Olmstead, the park movement in Contra Costa County, to, and, and really to provide healthy places and preserve nature. Um, Bill Mott always said that getting money for your park project was like squeezing water out of rocks. And I feel that's so true. But also, my former boss and general manager of the park district, Pat O'Brien would tell me, you can do great things, but if no one knows about them, no one's gonna care. 
And that goes all the way back to the early artists, photographers, writers, and advocates to, to create the National Park Service and, and conservation leaders from the Sierra Club and many other organizations. So I will leave you with a final thought and it's appropriate today based on the recent court ruling uh, in favor of St. Mount Diablo. Both Hewlett Hornbeck and Senator John Nedgley told me many times, Bob, you have to use the law to even the playing field against powerful interests that don't agree with your priorities. And I can't think of that uh, as something I've always, always kept with me. Um, I've had support as the general manager of the park district and as chief of land through the years to get the best lawyers to do the best job, to protect the land and to do the right thing, to make sure that uh, the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted for legal agreements and for planning documents and EIRs. And I really uh, want to just say there will be many more challenges ahead. The challenges of climate, the challenge of equitable access to parklands for all people. Um, and I think that we've got to continue what we've done with advocacy and what Save Mount Diablo has done for the past 50 years. And I'm so proud to have been a part of it. And uh, I really appreciate being asked to talk about that history today. Um, there weren't always successes, but the majority were big successes. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bob. This was really very special. And we did think of you right away when we thought of uh, who we would want to ask to do our presentation for uh, our 50th anniversary and all of uh, the amazing things that we have behind us and ahead of us. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Karen Ferrier, Development Director at Save Mount Diablo, if you don't already know me. Um, we don't have that many questions. A lot of people were really just thrilled and so happy to hear things. One I have to add is um, you, we got a big happy belated birthday from everyone at East Bay Regional Park District to Bob. So just wanted to share that. Thank um, you. Birthdays are cool. <laughs> of course. Uh, let's see here. Somebody mentioned that Mark Desaunier would be a good person to look at for support and advocacy for our area. Um, I do know that we have several um, you know, different um, representatives of the state um, that, that support us and really do believe in the work we're doing, but you might also have a comment on that one. Absolutely. Uh, Mark basically um, was elected after George Miller retired. Uh, George Miller, obviously a great environmental champion, but Mark has been a champion uh, for parks, for access, for equity and inclusion for all populations uh, since the beginning of his career. Uh, in Contra Costa County, in Concord, then Contra Costa County. And we would not have Concord's uh, final agreements and really the distribution of that property to the Park District without Mark Desaunier. Mark has also proposed that um, we figure out a way to get funding for a very special in, uh, education center there. And I'm hopeful that it'll be like a peace center where people can work things out and where people can learn from the environment that way and, and work together to preserve it. And Mark's a big advocate. Um, yeah, no, thank you. Um, we have also, uh, what, what an inspiring presentation. Um, thank you for a wonderful history. How do you assess the current popular support for more parks? Well, I think it's as difficult as uh, my last year was the COVID year at the park district. And I think the public has been so appreciative of keeping all the parks available when there was nothing else to do. Uh, one of my staff would say there was no, we're the only game in town. And that was so true. And what's happened from that is a lot of people who weren't park users, weren't big hikers, didn't know a lot about the parks, have learned a lot more about all the parks. Um, the national parks are overflowing. The state parks are overflowing. So we need to transfer <clears throat> that love of these parks, newfound and longtime support. We need to build on that. Uh, the state park system is so old now, it really needs a lot of infrastructure work. But I think the support is out there. We just have to attach ourselves to it and continue that advocacy. Thank you. Um, we also have one, what, um, whoops, 
What was the role of photographer Bob Walker in advocacy for Morgan Territory? And I know that um, that's close to your heart. Bob Walker was a dear friend. Um, I had hired Bob Walker to take pictures of property I wanted to acquire, but hadn't acquired yet. Uh, and he, he learned uh, not to get flight sick up in the helicopter to take pictures sometimes, and he loved it. <coughs> Bob was a, 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 on the board of Save Mount Diablo. Uh, I invited him to be on the board. And uh, he was a wonderful photographer, but it included Morgan Territory. It included all the parks, not just Morgan Territory. He happened to love it because the park district allowed dogs to hike on the trails and he had a dog. He also was a huge advocate for the establishment of a, a brand new park called Pleasanton Ridge, which is now 10 miles long. So Bob was a tremendous person. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I've, I've heard so many great stories about him and um, seen amazing pictures and whatnot. And I, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to meet him. Um, let's see here. Choo, choo, choo. Of course, thank you um, for all of your efforts and work. Um, somebody was asking about the plans going with the huge Port Chicago property. I don't know if you know anything about that. Well, that, that was... Um... So interestingly enough, when the Navy left the Concord Naval Weapons Station, the Army moved in to keep the, the shoreline portion. And that is still a very active military base. Uh, and there have been new improvements. Um, so they're very vested there. The, the wetland areas there will always be preserved. There's already an agreement with the Fish and Wildlife Service to manage those as natural wetlands. But I believe the, the military um, will be there for. For, for as long as we can think. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, we have a comment that Contra Costa County is one of the, whoops, something jumped up here, is one of the fastest growing regions in the United States and protecting open space is more important than ever. And thank you, Bob, and Save Mount Diablo for saving open space, um, especially against the hard pushing developers. So that was a really nice one. Um, I think that I can put this one in here and I'm sure um, Ted might be able to add something here, but it was, thank you, you know, really appreciate um, everything you've done for parks and open space. Um, honestly, your name is pretty much synonymous with parks and open space, <laughs> so, so thank you. Um, how can SMD leverage the assistance and authorities of state and federal resource and regulatory agencies to protect and preserve open space and natural resources in Contra Costa County? If I can just jump in there real quick. Yes, think, that one's for you. But yeah, okay. One of the things is that the Habitat Conservancy has really been a huge benefit to preserving open space, but it only includes Eastern Contra Costa County. There is no extra funding in San Ramon Valley out towards Tassajara. Uh, there is no extra funding in other parts of the area through a Habitat, which is the Fish and Wildlife of state and federal agencies, but we have a we do have a lot in some of the fastest growing areas, which is which is the eastern portion. And uh, I really want to thank John Kopchak uh, for his original uh, leadership and getting that going. And Seth was a big part of uh, when it was controversial. He kept it, kept pushing it, and so there's really been a lot of progress that way. But there is a need to continue the funding, and we have our legislators, which I really encourage everyone uh, to, to stay involved with. You don't have to just be Save Mount Diablo to write a letter to your legislator and say, we love open space, please preserve, please. The governor's made a commitment for 30 by 30, but we haven't seen a transfer of funding down into the agencies or locally for that money. Great. Um, I'll have one more question. And then for everyone who um, has, uh, put some questions here that were related just to some uh, Save Mount Diablo directly and that we don't have time for. We'll be sure to include the answers to these questions in the uh, thank you email with the recording to this event um, so everyone can see them. But here's one for you, lastly. What has been the relationship of East Bay Regional Park and East Bay Mud in terms of preserving open space? Uh, well, the original creation of the park district was the surplus land of East Bay, uh, the water district, East Bay Mud. Mm -hmm. uh, in and around Mount Diablo, we don't have really the water district except for San Ramon Valley. They don't have any watershed lands. It's Contra Costa County 
water district that has Los Vaqueros and the watershed lands in those areas. And so there had been a lot of recreation, um, uh, both in Contra Loma uh, for the Contra Costa Water District, but in the Chabot Parks and the Oakland Hills, a lot of East Bay Mud partnerships uh, to create parks in their watershed. All of Chabot, the majority of uh, Anthony Chabot and Lake Chabot were East Bay Mud watershed lands. Got it. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, so we're a little over five after five o'clock. So I really, really appreciate this. It's been super interesting. We, we have the recording. So in the, the one of the blessings of Zoom is that we can record this and share it with so many more people that might not have been able to join. So thank you again and your time and your dedication. And I know that we'll be hearing from you again. So thank and, you. And congratulations to Save Mount Dabo for 50 years. Thank you.